and welcome to the launch of this wonderful book on this day she putting women back into history one day at a time. I'm Derek Roburn from Five Leaves Bookshop in Nottingham and we're welcoming in this order um, Tanya Hirschman and here she is looking at the black flap for the uh, Tanya Hirschman, a poet and writer based in Manchester. Uh, Tanya is a former science journalist and is the author of three short story collections, three books of poetry and um, writing short stories, a writer's and artist's companion. All three compilers of this great book are writers themselves. Um, Tanya will talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll hand over Sorry. Yeah, it is Tanya, isn't it, first of all? Hand over to Elsa. Um, Elsa Holland is a poet, artist and writer based in Macclesfield, formerly a literary historian. She's the author of a poetry pamphlet and the founder of Mermaid Press. And in May 2019, she gave a TEDx talk on this book. Well, on the beginning of it on Twitter, they'll talk about that later. The third speaker is Jo Bell, a poet and writer based in Cheshire. Well, she lives on a boat. Are you really based in Cheshire? <laughs> her first career was an archaeologist specialising in industrial remains and recording sites in Turkey for surveyed by Gertrude Bell. Some of you around Nottingham, the East Midlands, will remember Jo because she organised the Three Cities event we had back in early 2000. So I can't remember exactly when, maybe 2004 or so. Um, there won't be a Q&A as such. I'll ask a few questions at the end while we're sorting out our prize giving. Each speaker will ask a question and um, there, there's three prizes, one for each speaker's question. Uh, they'll talk more about that. Um, you'll have to hang on to the end to find out more about it. Um, what else was I supposed to say in housekeeping? Oh, yeah. Um, you can use the chat box for comments and questions and tell us where you're um, based, where you're joining us from. Um, and of course, you can buy the books from Five Leaves and Pippa will put the link for that. We're online at the moment. I mean, I don't mean just we're online in the event, but we've got a, a website rather than being open. So um, Tanya is going to kick us off. Tanya Hirschman. Thank you so much, Deirdre. Um, I, oh, I'm just trying to adjust my Zoom view. Um, hopefully you're all seeing me. Um, it's so lovely to be here and we've had just the most wonderful day. This is actually our publication day. So we've had so much love for our book on Twitter and on social media and all over the place that it's just, very overwhelming and um, you'll be glad to hear though that we're actually only each of us are going to talk for 10 minutes each 10 or so minutes because we would really like to keep this event short and sweet because we do understand that all of us are spending so long staring at screens so we'd rather whet your appetite and then leave you wanting more so we're going to try and finish um, at eight o'clock um, but please do use the chat box to tell us where you're tuning in from and say anything you want would like to say to join in with our celebration um, so um, we're going to talk each for about 10 minutes or so to give you um, a little bit about some of the women in our book. Um, here is the book and a little bit about some of the themes. And I wanted to just first say this is very difficult because we would all like to tell you about all the women in our book. And then we would like to tell you about all the women we didn't manage to put in the book. And then we would like to tell you about the woman we tweeted about today and the woman we tweeted about a week ago and then the woman we tweet tweeted last year because there's just so many and it's a very difficult task but we're going to definitely try and keep it to 10 or so minutes each and I have my timer going but before I start with that I have the excellent task of making doing some thank yous and our first massive thank you is to our wonderful agent Kate Johnson of Mackenzie Wolf, without whom I'm not sure we would be here on this day holding our book. Kate, you are brilliant. I know you're here tonight and we're going to embarrass you by just saying you're so amazing. Joe is holding a flower for you. You are your support and your belief in us from the very beginning. And 
right and through till now has just been so wonderful. So thank you for everything you've done. And our next big thank you is to Ellie Carr and our whole team at Bonnier Books, including Jenna and Ali who are doing the marketing and publicity and Laura who's doing the audiobook and so many others. We knew from that very first conference call we had with you when we were pitching our book that you were the publishers for us because you just got what we were doing. And we have not been disappointed. In fact, this book just exceeds all our expectations. It's just beautiful and also so very heavy. And as several people have said, the paper is really gorgeous. So thank you to everyone at Bonnier and at John Blake for helping us bring all these women out into the world. And our final thank you is to Deirdre for hosting and to Pippa and Ross and all the team at Five Leaves who've had some exciting news today because Five Leaves Bookshop have been shortlisted once again for Independent Bookshop of the Year for their region, an accolade that they won in 2018 and were shortlisted for in 2019. So when we are able to, and if you find yourself near Nottingham, you really need to go into Five Leaves. So thank you for having us. You're the ideal host and we're delighted to be launching this through you and if you haven't bought the book yet or you'd like to buy more copies please do do it through five leaves who will be periodically putting the link for buying the book in the chat box right i have uh just under nine minutes left to give you a little whistle stop tour so i wanted to talk a little bit personally we all come at this endeavor of putting women back into history one day at a time from, from our different backgrounds and our different interests. And although we're all really passionate about all the women that we research and the ones in the book and in the Twitter account, we have our different um, specialities and mine is science. And I studied maths, physics and chemistry at A-level. And then I studied maths and physics at university and for the past 30 years, I have been making light of the fact, I've been making a joke out of the fact that I wasn't very good at the maths and physics at university. So I became a science journalist to write about the people doing the science who were much better at it. But when last week we were preparing to do our very, very first On This Day She event, I suddenly had a thought. And I remember this idea from psychology, there's a concept called priming. And basically what this means is, for example, say you have a group of girls who are about to take a maths exam and you tell these girls that girls are really good at maths. They will do better on the exam than they would have done. And the inverse, if you tell this group of girls say, and it could be any group, that girls are worse, do badly at maths, they will do worse on the exam. And people can be primed in different ways, not just by being told, but by what we see or what we don't see. And I suddenly realized that during my A-levels, during my degree, no woman was ever mentioned. None of my lecturers were women. 80% of the students on my degree course were men. And what if that was some kind of priming? What if I never saw anyone who might have looked like me? And so I never really believed that maybe I could be a physicist. And this is part of our mission here on this day, she is what we want to do is add to that positive priming, that idea, if you can't see it, you can't be it. But we're trying to show you that you can see it and that anything you could possibly think of that you might want to do, a woman has done it. So I'm going to very quickly bring you an example or two. And the first example, it's really very heavy to hold this book. Um, just to very quickly, in case um, you're not familiar with the concept, it's one woman per day for the entire year. And we tried to find a day on which the woman, woman did something that was important to her, not just the day on which she was born or died, but um, it, it, at least the month that she did the thing that was important to her, where we can. And as you can imagine, this gets harder as you go further back in history. And our book covers hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years. And we tried to cover many countries as well. So 24th of September, we have Rita Levi Montalcini, and she's an Italian scientist, and I apologize for my accent, and I'll show you that if you can see this is a picture. And I wanted to bring you Rita Levi Montalcini because she was a neuroscientist, and she got her degree in 1936, but then in 1938, the Italian government passed anti-Semitic laws, and Rita Levi Montalcini, being Jewish, was no longer allowed to go into the university to work as an assistant to her professor. So she set up a lab at home in her bedroom. 
1986, together with biochemist Stanley Cohen, Rita Levy Montalcini won the Nobel Prize for research that began in her lab in her bedroom, the discovery of nerve growth factor. I wanted to say as well, in 1975, Rita Levy Montalcini was the first woman to join the Vatican's Pontifical Academy of Sciences. And when she turned 100 in 2009, she became the oldest living Nobel laureate. I have to say that if we were planning a fantasy dinner party, and this is something we have thought about, I would want Rita Levy Montalcini there. And I wish I had known about her. And she's one of those women. This happens to us all the time. And it happens to us on the Twitter account where people say, why have I not heard of her? The second woman I'm going to bring you, we're going back a couple of hundred years. We're going back to from Italy to England to meet Elizabeth Nihel, who was an English midwife. And I'm going to show you a picture of Elizabeth Nihel. And she was practicing midwifery in London in the mid 18th century. And one of the things that when we did research, themes began to emerge. And one of the themes that, began, that emerged very often is that there would be a profession that women had often done and then men would start to enter this profession. They would set up a professional society for that profession, and then they would exclude the women. And we see this happening with midwives. And we have more than one midwife in this book. We have two French midwives later on in the book. After attending 900 births in 1760, Elizabeth Nihel published a treatise on the art of midwifery, setting forth various abuses therein, especially as to the practice with instruments. She had a flair for a snappy title. She was very angry with the male doctors. She saw them as lacking in empathy and that they were far too eager to intervene in childbirth with instruments such as forceps. She mocked the male midwives as well. And uh, she responded to one of her critics by calling him a buffoon. In her 1772 book, The Danger and Immodesty of the Present Two General Customs of Unnecessarily Employing, employing Men Midwives. She did not pull any punches, Elizabeth Nihel. Very sadly, after her surgeon husband abandoned her, Nihal spent the final year of her life in poverty, dying in a workhouse. The third woman I'm bringing you is we're moving away from science and medicine and we're moving countries again, and we're moving to America in the 21st century to Erica Bridgeford. Hopefully you can see her. Erica Bridgeford is an African-American mediator and activist who lives in Baltimore, Maryland. And I don't know how many of you know this about Baltimore, but it's got one of the highest murder rates in the US with a death every 19 hours. Erica Bridgeford was pretty fed up with this. She told the BBC, my brother got killed. I've lost my stepson. I've lost cousins. Two weeks ago, I lost somebody. Some years I go to two funerals in one day and she decided she was gonna do something about it. So in May, 2017, she decided to put out a call for the first ceasefire weekend. And on the 4th of August, the day that we have her in the book, from the 4th to the 6th of August, this was the first ceasefire weekend, thousands of people came to community events and Baltimore went a record 67 hours without a murder. Two people were killed on the second day of the ceasefire and more during the second ceasefire weekend because Bridgeford has run this more than once. And she then asked people to show up at the sites of these deaths to create a kind of sacred space ritual for it. And the third ceasefire weekend in February 2018 saw a record 11 days without homicides. And she was named Marylander of the Year. And she's continuing to hold these ceasefires and the idea has, sp has spread to other cities. When I heard about her, it just, you know, it just blew my mind. I'm coming to the end of my 10, 11 minutes, and I wanted to end on perhaps a slightly more surprising and less savoury note. And we're moving countries again to Denmark and to the 3rd of March. On this day in 1921, Danish serial killer Dagmar Overby was sentenced to death for killing nine children, including her own daughter. This is a horrific story. Dagmar Overby was one of Denmark's most notorious serial killers. Unmarried women who wanted to put their babies up for adoption would give them to Dagmar who promised to find families for them, but she didn't in fact find families for them. She was sentenced to death. As a direct result of the trial though, in 1923, 
a law was passed in Denmark establishing public homes for illegitimate children. But this isn't why we've included her in the book. We've included her in the book because it's always been a part of our mission of putting women back into history, but it's not just the inspiring women that we're putting back into history. And at the beginning of every month of the book, we have a little mini essay. That's my timer going off. Stop that now. We have a little mini essay on a different topic at the beginning of every month. And these were themes and topics and things that came up as we were weaving the book together. And I just thought I'd finish my time today with a little quote from the topic that starts March, the month that has Dagmar over by in it. And she's not the only grim woman, as we call them, that are in our book, because we believe, well, I'm gonna read this to you. So this, this uh, introductory March article is called Women Are People Too. Women are not here to inspire you. Women are not your muses. They are real flesh and blood, often flawed humans. Yes, many of them are astonishing, brave and worthy of celebration, but to highlight only these women will be doing women and men a disservice. It is not just men throughout history who have behaved badly. And until we bring these women out of the shadows, history will be incomplete. I now hand over to the wonderful Elsa Holland. Hello, thank you. So I'm going to start um, by actually showing you a different book, not our book, it's rather controversial. So this book, it's called How to Suppress Women's Writing. And I bought it, the inside tells me, in 1988. So it was in my first year at university studying literature and it enraged and inspired me in equal measure. So Joanna Russ explores with humor and rage how over the centuries, women's writing has been suppressed because either people have said, oh, it was actually written by a man or she wrote it, but it wasn't really literature because she wrote about being, at, sorry, being at home. Um, and when we were starting to put our book together, we realized that the ways in which women were left out of literary history has parallels for the way they've been left out of history more generally. Um, and so we've begun our book with a tribute to Joanna Ross, um, How to Leave Women Out of History. I'll just read you the first few. She wasn't there. She was there, but she didn't do anything. She was there and she did something, but she was only the wife, mistress, courtesan, girlfriend, muse, so she doesn't count. She was there and did something, but it wasn't her idea. She was just his assistant. And so he should get all the credit and win all the prizes. There's a saying, isn't there? History is written by the victors. And we usually think about this in terms of like conflicts between nation states and how the one who wins the war gets to write the history of what the war meant. But doing this project has made me think about that saying in a different sense about the, the kind of the victors within one society. Because we could also say that when we look at it at a practical level, history is written by people who have time to do it. Time left over from all the things they need to do to stay alive. And they don't just need a little bit of time. They need a lot of time to do research and think and draft and redraft their writing. And they also have to have some sort of education, maybe an extended education. They have to have access to places to do the research. And all these things mean money. And if they're ever to be known about, they need publishers or commissioning editors of films or TV to put their work into a film that can into a form that can be shared. And of course, people who are not the victors in their society don't often have these things. So if their work is kind of relentless and it's that everyday work of staying alive and keeping other people alive, they don't have that time. Oppressed minorities, of course, belong in that category. So we can see, for example, how that narrative around the ab abolition of slavery likes to celebrate, you know, the, um, the contributions of white abolitionists like William Wilberforce, whereas actually probably the truth is more that enslaved people organized rebellions and the, the work of abolitionists while 
important was not the whole story. William Wilberforce, by the way, was a terrible misogynist. Look up Anne Knight in the book and you'll get that story. Um, and so, of course, if we're talking about time shortage, we also need to talk about a group within society which is not a minority, in fact, often a, ma a majority, a small majority, but has traditionally been very time poor and often money poor and opportunity poor. And that, of course, is women. Some women, of course, often it's often been academics, have found time and have been able to write about what other women have done. But so often this work wasn't then republished beyond their generation. So it was kind of forgotten. And then the women that they'd written about had to be discovered again. I have a book about the medieval writer Christine de Pizan and the introduction begins there cannot have been many writers who have been publicly discovered as often as Christine de Pizan. And people now are still surprised if you say, well, yes, there were female authors in the Middle Ages. You know, they weren't all mucking out the pigs or whatever. Um, so yeah, history is a story and we see it, I guess, in that way very strongly because we're writers. It's created, it's constructed, and it's defined by what you leave out as much as by what you put in. And often people are interested, including the stories of people who are like them. They write about people who are like them because those are the people they can see and those are the people that can identify with. So if history is mostly written by people of the same sex, race, class, sexuality, this has a really big effect because it shapes our knowledge of the past and it shapes our expectations of the present and the future. I think and we've seen this recently, this big discussion around Hollywood films and them becoming more diverse to bring in more um, women's stories and more stories about ethnic minorities. Um, when we started, decided to start on this day, she, of course, we were also constrained by time and money. Um, and that, that was a big factor in our decision to just start the project on Twitter because it was kind of quickish and free. Um, but I'm so glad we found the time, made the time to do it. Um, and the publication of this book that makes these stories a bit more available, not just stuck in a corner of the internet or stuck in a history book that's too expensive for anybody to buy. That feels like a small victory to me and it makes me very happy. I've been giddy all day. Anyone who's been living around me will tell you. So um, I'm just going to, with my the minutes I have left, I'm going to tell you about two women from the book who found a way to do the thing that they wanted to do in an unusual way and engaged with the world. So the first is Frances Glessner Lee. And she's in the book for the 30th of October. Um, she came from a very wealthy family in the US. And when she was a child, she loved Sherlock Holmes stories and um, also the, the figure of Dr. Watson. And she really wanted to become a doctor, but her parents forbade that. And so she had to wait until they were dead and she got divorced from her husband. And in her fifties, she contributed $250,000, this was in the 1930s, so that was a lot of money, I don't know how much that would be worth now, to Harvard University to set up a Department of Legal Medicine. And she also donated to them a huge archive that she built up over the years as her hobby, which was books and articles and documents and photos all around crime and criminal justice. And donating that money and setting up that department gave her a way of making what had had to be her private passion into more public work. And then in October 1943, when she was 65, she was appointed New Hampshire State Police's first female captain and their educational director. And she wanted to think of a way to train police officers in observing and collecting forensic evidence at crime scenes. Um, and she came up with the idea of making little doll's house sized dioramas of crime scenes, which she called the nutshell studies of unexplained death. I'll read you a bit from the book. We don't have a picture of her, unfortunately, in the book. Um, 
Okay. Based on true crimes, the scenes, which were all dwellings of poor or marginalized people, were imagined by Lee and intricately detailed with working doors, windows, and lights. For each scene, which had titles like dark bathroom and unpapered bedroom, they're all quite gothic, Glessner Lee carved clothes pegs out of matchsticks, rolled tiny cigarettes and knitted jumpers with pins. The meticulous care given to each model, her carpenter said it took as long as building a real house, demonstrates her em empathy for people with lives so different from her own. She's now called the mother of modern CSI. And she had a belief that every death, whatever social class, required equal attention. Convict the guilty, she said, clear the innocent and find the truth in a nutshell. And I think that's that she is so inspiring to me because she did the thing that we know her about now from the age of 65 onwards. And the second person I want to talk about is uh, from a very different field. She's a musician, a cellist um, called Lise Christiani, who was alive in the 18th, in the 19th century. And we do have a picture of her. I never know which way to put this. Uh, can you see her there? And um, she is the first known female solo cellist. And she played at a time when being a, a woman and a cellist was considered really scandalous because the cello was held between the legs. Um, and a lot of women at the time played kind of side saddle with the cello. I've no idea how they did it. Must have twisted themselves in all sorts of strange ways. Um, but as far as we know, Christiani didn't play that act. She played in what we would call the modern way, the, the proper way. And she became really successful. And after a successful concert tour of Paris, Rouen and Brussels, in 1844, she bought herself a Stradivarius cello, which she called Lord Stradivarius, my noble husband. But she wasn't happy just playing in the salons of Europe. And she wanted to see more of the world than that. Um, and so she set off on an extraordinary, really dangerous tour to the furthest reaches of Russia and she took her cello with her in a steel case, sealed with lead and covered with wolf skins. She said, I visited 15 Siberian cities. I crossed more than 400 streams and rivers. I traveled by sleigh, cart, litter, pulled by horses, reindeer, dogs. I gave around 40 public concerts. I played in places where no artist had hereto set foot. I was more at ease than in the salons of St. Petersburg. Tolstoy wrote in his diary about hearing her play in 1853, but she died later that year of cholera while she was on her journey. And now her cello husband is in the Stradivarius Museum in Cremona and he's called the Christiani. So that's that from me. Just a couple of the women in the book whose stories I really love. Thank you. And now I'm handing over to Jo Bell. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, and it's it's lovely to see all the comments, especially the one from Rosie Diamond, who says I'm going to have to buy several copies of this book for all my friends. We like that sort of comment, especially. I'm going to ask my my on this day she sisters to stand up briefly so that you can all see our chests, because our avatar on the On This Day She Twitter account is the Venus of Willendorf, Venus of Willendorf. And so we've all got a t-shirt with a different version of Venus on it. And we've decided that the collective noun for On This Day She Is is a Willendorf. Uh, so that's, that's um, our little gesture to um, being in the same room together, sort of. It's really nice to see the comments coming in. Uh, yay to the chests, excellent chests, says Olga. Thank you very much. Um, it's really nice because although we, of course, have lived with this book for a couple of years now, really, uh, and been putting it together and anticipating it, we'd kind of forgotten how exciting and empowering it might be for people seeing it for the first time today uh, or this week. 
and the gradual trickle of people saying, wow, I just got my book, isn't it beautiful? Or uh, look at all these women and watching in particular the comments now about how excited you all are about the women we're talking about is, is fantastic. Thank you so much. This book would not exist without your support and help. So we're really, really grateful for that. Um, obviously you'll be buying it from Five Leaves, but if you were buying it from a certain large uh, bookstore, you would see that it's already number two in its category there today. So um, we're, we're doing pretty well. And that's thanks to you folks. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, two or three women. I must just register the time that I've started talking at um, so that I don't vastly overrun because nobody ever left one of these events saying, gosh, I wish it had been longer. Um, but you are presumably all at home in your pyjamas drinking gin so uh, you can relax a little bit. I'm going to start um, with someone some of you may remember because our book is not just about women of the ancient times but it's also about women like polystyrene, who charmingly is in our index as styrene poly. Um, and she's best known, some of you will remember uh, the single that she's best known for. On this day in 1977, punk band X-Ray Specs released their single, Oh Bondage Up Yours. Um, that's in this book for the 30th of September. And that launched polystyrene, a Somali British singer, as an unlikely icon of UK popular culture. So I'm going to read you a bit of her entry. Born Marianne Elliott Said in Kent, she ran away from home at 15 and formed X-Ray Specs four years later. She became a leading figure in the punk movement, writing the songs, making the band's artwork. Melodic, she was not. A bag full of cats was more harmonic, said one reviewer. Punk was discordant, amateurish, and profoundly shocking to mainstream culture. Its impact went far beyond music, challenging attitudes to class, race, and gender, consumerism, and politics. X-ray specs joined the likes of Blondie, The Slits, and The Pretenders, all fronted by sexually confident women with loud voices, untidy hair, ripped clothes, and foul mouths. Polystyrene was a mixed race, working class woman with braces on her teeth and day glow clothing who rejected traditional ideas of ladylike behavior and sex appeal, asserting that if anyone tried to turn her into a sex symbol, she would shave her head. The vision she offered was anarchic, unsettling and liberating, paving the way for later riot girl groups like Bikini Kill and Pussy Riot. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got someone saying huge crush from my youth. Hello, Sean. Uh, this sounds familiar, says uh, Jen Maddock, who is part of my bubble and may be referring to the sexually confident women with loud voices and untidy hair. Um, but that's the point about some of the women in, these book, in, in this book, that they, they weren't ladylike. It isn't always possible uh, to be ladylike and change history or to get what they wanted, to do what they wanted. Uh, and so they often had to subvert ideas of what would be ladylike and be rather shocking uh, and put up with a lot of, a lot of scrutiny. Uh, it also makes me think of the Edinburgh Seven who are also in this book, medical students in Edinburgh who just wanted to do a medicine degree like all their male peers and were stoned in the streets. They had muck thrown at them. They had a sheep uh, herded into the exam room as they sat their medical exams and still they did it. Nevertheless, they persisted. So polystyrene is one of them. Uh, and I want to talk briefly about Jane Hallwood, unfortunate name, um, who is in our book for the 20th of March. And she was a spy. The thing about um, being underestimated by the people around you because you're a woman is that it makes being a woman a great disguise. And so Jane Horwood was a spy during the English Civil War in the 1640s. And on this day in 1648, 20th of March, she organised King Charles I attempted escape from Carisbrook Castle, where he was being held by parliamentary forces. Um, the attempt failed because the king had failed to measure the window and established that he could get through it. So uh, he didn't actually get through it, but it wasn't for lack of trying from Jane Horwood, who had done 
a lot of organizing, a lot of smuggling of messages and smuggling of finance. She smuggled a lot of gold in barrels of soap into uh, Oxford in order to finance the transport of the future Charles II over to France. Um, and the third one I'm, woman I'm going to tell you about, um, we're just touching on these women, of course, not going into them in any depth, is one of the kind of the unsuccessful activists of history because they count too. And sometimes luck is an element in whether we remember them in mainstream history or not. This lady, um, and again, we don't have uh, pictures of all of them. Where is she? There she is. This uh, unassuming little old lady is Margaret Harrison. Um, who was a Scot who on the 12th of June in 1982 set up a tent in a lay-by in Scotland next to the naval base at Fast Lane and began the protest which is still going on there. I was there last year and there's still a few grubby little caravans sitting in a lay-by with people talking to one another and making flasks of tea and sharing their commitment to the anti-nuclear movement. Now they haven't been successful, you will have noticed, but the act of protest, the act of organizing, the act of peaceful uh, commitment to an opposition point of view has often been something that women have done. And a lot of the women in this book have been organizers of protests, have been leaders of strikes, or um, organizers of abolition movements, and protests of that sort. So a great many of the immense protests, the civil rights protests and so on that you can think of in history, the Chartist movement, a lot of those movements have been led and organized very substantially by women who have behind the scenes made sure that everyone got there on time, made sure that everyone had their sandwiches, made sure that everyone knew where to meet at a particular time. Uh, and they are the unsung heroes time and time again of uh, meetings where the main orators were men, but the main organizers were very often women. So I wanted to talk about them. Um, for, I, I, it occurs to me to say that for those of you who, oh, it's, Deb is saying my birthday is the 12th of June and she did part of the Aldermaston to Faslane March in the 1980s. So you may even have met uh, someone who's in our book, that's fantastic. Um, I wanted to remind you that for those of you who like listening to books, um, the audio book is going to be available soon, narrated by Imogen Church, who's a great narrator um, and a great voice and great supporter of ours. Um, and I wanted to talk also just a little bit about the default male in history, which is one of the little chapters that I've written. Uh, we haven't extended into any great length these introductory chapters because the internet exists and what we are trying to do is point you towards things and sources of material and subjects of research that you might be interested in and if you are interested in them pursue it go forward find out more about them write about them make quilts about them do anything about them but uh, one of the women I've sp spoken about in some of our previous events is the Viking warrior who was excavated in 1868 and naturally, 1878, and naturally was assumed to be a man because a great many weapons had been buried with this skeleton. It was in a military settlement. It was beside a fort. All the signals were that this was a warrior. It was discovered in 2017 by DNA analysis that this was the skeleton of a woman and all hell broke loose because the default assumption of history had been that this would be a man. It was proved beyond all doubt that this was in fact the skeleton of a woman and a warrior, probably a cavalry, cavalry leader. Um, and it was so extraordinary how much indignation was aroused even in 2017 in the archeological press that that should be the case. It couldn't be true. She couldn't be a warrior and a woman. And the reason we've highlighted that is that very often the skeletons don't survive in the past. Very often what we're looking at, and I speak as a former archeologist, is artifacts which don't have chromosomes to tell us who owned them. And so we are constantly assuming that the remains we're looking at are those of men when sometimes they're women. The chances of there being a mass regiment of Viking women are very, very small, but there were some 
and we must keep our minds open to that possibility. So um, thank you for listening to us. We're going to wind up in a little while, but um, we have a giveaway, as is traditional when one has a new book out uh, and we want to share the love a little bit. So we are going to ask you a question each. The book can only be won, sadly, by someone in the UK. Or if you're not in the UK, perhaps you want to um, give it to someone who does live in the UK. Uh, and so what we're going to do is each ask a question, lob the answers into the chat section, and Pippa of Five Leaves is going to valiantly sort through them and pick out a winner. And hopefully uh, we'll be able to have three winners by the time we wind up at eight o'clock. So they're all questions about women in the book. Uh, and mine is, which woman of the Wild West was spoken of in these terms by her friend, George Hoshier? He said, the way she got that name was, she was always in trouble. Uh, so that's my question. If you want to make a stab at the answer, just stick it in the uh, chat section. And Pip is going to pick out some, rather than the first person, which just means the fastest typist, fastest typist in the West, uh, she's going to pick at random a winner for each question and let us know at the end who is going to, um, who is going to be the person uh, who wins. So I'm going to hand over now to Tanya to ask her question and then Ailsa and then we'll head over to Deirdre again. Thank you, Joe. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask my question. I think also Pippa asked us to say that if you can let us know, um, we, we if you have registered for the event under a different name. This has all got very complicated. Just <laughs> just so she knows what email to find you on if she does pick you as the winner. Um, we might have to clarify that again since my head is spinning, but maybe Elsa, you can do a better job of clarifying that after me. So my question for my giveaway copy of our book is this. Who is the only person, person to have won two Nobel Prizes in two different scientific fields? There's a lot of typing going on in the chat box. Goodness. Um, I will now hand over to Elsa for her question. Right, so mine, because I kind of maybe always actually wanted to be on University Challenge, is a picture question. So, um, so this is the picture. And my question is, which Italian artist painted this woman getting her revenge? So that's that one. And... Um, yeah, so I think we'll probably let Pippa choose winners. And then at the end, um, oh, she's just put them in the chat again for everyone. And um, and then at the end, if you're picked and you're registered under a different name from the name that's in the chat, you'll have to let us know so that um, Pippa can get in touch with you about getting getting your book sent to you. Uh, by, by the way, the, the answers to all the questions are women from the book. I just wanted to mention that again, since we're getting a few, a few non-female answers here. What? Um, yeah. Um, uh, Pippa will be posting the questions periodically in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> and we will tell you all the answers at the end. Cool. Are we handing back over to Deirdre? Yes, sorry. I was meant to do that. That was fine. That was absolutely terrific. I just loved us. Um, I know your friends. Were there times when you're <laughs> you're not? Joe Bell is shaking her head. Were there times when you were working through this? When you were thinking, I I'm going to fight her over this. And how did you divide up? Who got what in? Shall, shall I shall I take this one? Shall I jump in? Yeah, yeah, go. Shall we all fight over it? Yeah. <laughs> just to say it was such a difficult job choosing just 366 women for the book. And we say 366 because we put in February the 29th in there just so we can get another woman in. But already when, when we were compiling the book, we'd already been tweeting for a year and a half. So we had 
oh, I can't even add up, over 500 women that we'd already tweeted about. We already, we also had so many more in our calendar coming up and we're adding to, we're adding to our list to add to the calendar constantly as well. And we will never get through the list to add to the calendar, let alone the calendar to the Twitter account. So we put together um, a draft list, which we called the mistress list for the book. And then the list just kept shifting um, and it kept shifting so that we could get a really good and diverse range of women across nationalities, races, ethnicities, religion, sexuality, um, across all time periods, across all as many fields and topics as possible from science and art to sports um to inventors i mean i could, could just go on and on but we wanted we were going for a huge diversity and you'll see when you look through the book um that you know you will vote people on two two following pages are very rarely from the same country or from the same time period um so we really really tried to shape the list with that in mind of giving as much diversity as possible and I don't think we had any fist fights, but there were times no, we would be we, like, we, well, I want to have this woman and that, I'm sorry, yeah. this is mine. <laughs> I think we agreed that we would each have one non-negotiable. We would have one person that we could put our foot down and say, look, I don't care what you think. This is my, this is the hill I'm willing to die on. And to my own complete astonishment, <laughs> I found that mine was Margaret Thatcher. We were quite um, surprised by that too. No one was more surprised than me uh, to find myself arguing for the inclusion of Margaret Thatcher in a, a I am, I should be clear, no great fan of Margaret Thatcher's. Um, but I felt in the, the balance, the general balance we were trying to strike, it was important to stick her in there because, you know, like her or hate her, she was massively important. Um, and so those each of those conversations was illuminating whether it was you know well we've got to have her in well why have we got to have her in you know and in each of those conversations we were getting a little closer to what the book was about and what it wasn't about and uh the uh, the balance i think was important obviously our our respective backgrounds meant that we each wanted a particular kind of woman in there but we wanted a broad balance of nationalities, of races, of fields of endeavour. I had to give up on a few astronomers because we had so many astronomers that we, we, we had to have an astronomer quota. <laughs> I can't remember who mine was. I can't remember no. who my woman was. Tanya's was Marie Curie, I think. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Was mine Christine de Pisa? I think mine was mine, a yes, one. Me. Or Alice Chaucer or someone. Might have been Alice. <laughs> obviously there's makings of at least another book there what are you planning just on next it's a terrible question to ask people who've just produced something wonderful but what's next um it, if you look at the back of the book um there is a list of things that you might do next as a reader uh, and ways that uh, one might take forward the sort of general pursuit. So it's things like getting in touch with your local council to see if they can rename some streets, if they if they can name new streets with women's names and so on. There's the lovely Tanya modelling that, that page. Um, for us, one of the nice things about it has been understanding the impact of social media and that this project, of course, began as a Twitter account, we fairly quickly realised that we were accidentally writing a book and that it lent itself to a particular format. But to see how, particularly today, social media has taken up the book and run with it, there's no reason why there shouldn't be a hundred other projects that kind of run off from it um, set up or occupied, as it were, by different people. So, you know, there, there could easily be an equivalent project for, you know, German women or artists, particularly, or focusing on, on one particular, on women in science has been a particular flyer on the Twitter account, thanks to Tanya, who has often tagged them, hashtag women in STEM. Um, that's been a source of, of real joy for a lot of people who have lacked role models in that particular sphere. For us, as on this day sheet, yeah, there's going to be another book. Of course, there's going to be another book. Um, somebody had suggested... Have, if the publishers will have us. We haven't, we have to say we haven't cleared that yet with anybody. No, we're going to write another book. Whether anyone publishes it is, is a matter of, of some dispute. Um, and then someone said the other day, 
uh, we'd like a, a, a calendar, please, where you can tear one off a day, which is pretty much where we came in, as Elsa might explain. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, that was for anybody who doesn't know that yet. I feel like I tell this story quite a lot. But um, for anyone who doesn't know that yet, that was how the project started, that um, that I had a calendar. So we got a calendar for Christmas and um, there were, it had a, had a an event in history for every day and there were no blooming women in it or like not very many. And um, and it was my rage about that expressed to Joe and Tanya that was the what was it? The impetus. The impetus that the, lit the fuse that became the explosion that is on this day. She I may have mixed my metaphors there a little bit, but um, yeah. So we, I mean, wouldn't it be great to do loads of calendars on this day? She artists on this day. She sports on this day, and then you could give them to all of your all of your friends all the time, whatever their interests but, are. But Ailsa, you can do that already because whatever you do. <laughs> There's a woman in this book for you. <laughs> we didn't practice that at all. <laughs> I would like to say as well um, that, well, the book is coming out, we believe today in India as well as a kind of co-edition, the same, the same um, book, the same content. And it's going to be coming out in Australia in a couple of months. And, and perhaps in the future, we would love to do other editions for other countries where it will be mostly the same content, but we could. This is the Australian it. edition. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's good. <laughs> that's very rude. We've got people here. I know. From I'm New so York. sorry. Yeah. I know. I'm sorry. I'm so think... sorry. I'm so sorry, I'm Michelle. I'm really sorry. Who is in New Zealand? We just we just lost all the Australian yeah, and it. New Zealand audiences. Um, so we we've got a Maori gardener, and 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 actually we've got quite a few. We've got quite a few yeah. Maori women in the book. Actually. Yeah, yeah. And Australian. Um, yeah. I think there was something I was going to say and what was it oh yeah no there was also we would love to get the book into schools in some way as well um if we can or maybe even do you know some kind of spin-off educational materials or something like that you know just put it out there because I know that there's a load of teachers um who are in the audience tonight so that's a, that's an idea and maybe use it as a as a impetus as well for creative writing workshops I should stop there for a while Deirdre did you the terrific templates. I mean, the first thing I did was, of course, go in and see who's in there for Maryland. And I actually opened it at Constant Markovich. And, you know, I like the idea of being primed. So I'm here in my short skirt and stout boots. I couldn't get hold of a revolver, but that's lockdown for you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's much harder in lockdown to ha get, a ha get a revolver. We all... We all want a revolver now that we're in lockdown. You know, it, there'd be, yeah. you know, there'd be all kinds of things going if, on. If you don't know what revolver. we're referring to with Constance Markovich and the revolver, you'll have to read the book. And um, to find out the argument against the revolver, I, I shouldn't be joking about this, but you could read Veronica Gairn, another Irish woman that's in it. Yeah, I did see somebody said in the Q&A, we need to get it translated into Italian. So, oh, you know, yeah. the world is out there to be conquered. And I think it's a terrific idea. Um, I was thinking about documentaries and other media. Have you been approached or have you approached BBC Sky Arts or... Because I think it's made for that. Well, we we have um, a, a documentary filmmaker has been in touch with us who she's who has made um, documentaries already about um, women in history and who gets very frustrated by the difficulty of getting documentaries commissioned. Um, and she knows that uh, other people in her field feel the same. And she said, you know, if we're ever going to balance out the number of documentaries that are available about women in history with the number of documentaries of men in history, you know, it's going to take 500 years. <laughs> so, so um, you know, she said, you know, she's interested in doing lots of short films about women just to, so in a way, uh, not the same format as us, but a similar thing to just get lots of stories out there. Because I think for me, one of the things about doing the book, one, one of the things that's been so inspiring is, is not just the individual women, although of course they are, but the sense that because there's so many, you can't talk about any of them as somehow the token woman or that she was some sort of anomaly that, you know, she was a scientist in the 18th century. Ooh, you know, there were loads of scientists in the 18th century and it was just that we don't know about them. And so the inspiration of that, just that, yeah, just the numbers. And I think to replicate that in films, 
would be really brilliant. Um, we had, it had occurred to us also that, um, you know, the Neil, oh, what's his name, the director, former director of the British Museum, he did a series on, on radio of um, a history of the world in 100 objects. Uh, and it occurred to us that each of these women, as we've written them up, has highlighted certain issues about the wider social context, about the wider history in which they lived and existed. Uh, and raised sort of background illuminating issues about their time. So there, you know, there might be potential to do some short radio programs um, along those lines, something like that. A lot of people have suggested podcasts and things like that, but um, apart from anything else, it's, it's not a whole occupation this. So whatever we do has to be a good um, use of time. We can't just devote, we, we can't cover all possible angles. We've got to choose our battles as it were. But, but just to say as well that um, we're very excited and open to suggestion of, uh, you know, people being inspired by what we're doing and taking it and running with it. We have been told by our, our lovely publishers, who I think are here tonight, that they do believe that the more the three of us talk about the book, the more sales we're actually going to have, which I don't I don't think anyone's ever said that to us before. That a well, that's just as well. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't. All, what I'm trying to say is it doesn't always have to be us. And, you know, if anyone wants to, you know, run with any of the women and, you know, make a film about them and, you know, put more statues up. I've got a bit of thing about statues today. And there's and there's been a thing just in the last couple of days, hasn't there, that there's there are government plans to put up a load of sort of military statues and which will, of course, further deplete the percentage of statues in Britain that are actually of women because women weren't allowed to be in the military. So we're by definition excluded again. And um, there's so many. Although, women again, if you want to know about women uh, during wartime, do look up Miss Schilling's orifice in, in the book. That's a good one. That is a good one. Jilly Schilling. Um, and one of the things yeah. we've been able to do, which is lovely, is that we are able to say, well, yes, there were these women who did the same sort of things that men did, you know, and if they were men, they would have been in history books. So the scientists, the explorers, etc. But also to say, well, for us, this is also history. Erica Bridgeford is also history. Um, women, you know, who work for, for peace or um, Kitty, whose, whose surname I can't remember. Who, Wilkinson. Thank you, who saved you know, thousands of people in Liverpool by just enabling them to get clean and to, and to do their laundry. Um, so that, that's- The unglamorous that's, and unheroic yeah. things often. Yeah. yeah. You should you should probably stop us at some point, Deirdre, because we can just go on. And I, I've just um, I've just looked up. Um, uh, I think that's an answer coming in. I was looking for a message coming in from Pippa, but I think something has just arrived in the message box. Do you want to come in, Pippa, and let us know? I've got the, uh, I've got the winners here. Oh, there they are. Yes, we've got the winners, and we possibly ought to tell everyone what the answers are to our respective questions. So um, the winners. Shall I read the winners out? Yeah. The winners are apparently yeah. Sally Field, yeah. whom I know, that's not a fix, Olga, and Nobody someone knows. who's just disappeared off the top of the screen. Um, yeah. Felicity oh. Curry. Okay, Felicity Curry. And um, well done. So um, we will pass your details on to Jenna at Bonnier Books, I think, who is going to send out those free copies. Um, and the answers to our questions. My question was about jo the, the woman of the Wild West whom was who was described George Hosher her mate said the reason she got that name was she was always in trouble and it was of course Calamity Jane. And the answer to my question was that the person who was the only person to date to hold two Nobel Prizes in two different scientific fields is of course Marie Curie for physics and chemistry and I saw that someone answered Linus Pauling who firstly is not in our book, but secondly, he held two Nobel Prizes, one in science and one in peace. So Marie Curie is the only person to have two science Nobel Prizes. And the answer to mine, this wonderful painting, is Artemisia Gentileschi, um, the absolutely fabulous artist. And if it weren't for lockdown, there would have been, it was open very briefly, an exhibition of hers in the, um, Help me, British National Portrait Gallery. National, uh, no, National, National Gallery. Gallery. Um, Gallery. I think the first time that there's been a full retrospective of a female artist in the National Gallery ever, even though it's been open for 200 and something odd years. Um, and it hasn't happened now. 
<laughs> and it, well, it was open briefly and then they had to shut oh. it again for lockdown. But you can do an online tour of it. You have to pay something, but it's absolutely worth it. The paintings are just astonishing. So a little plug for the National Gallery there in case they're listening. <laughs> Just a reminder that if you're outside the UK and you've won a prize, are all those people inside in the UK? Because if they're not, I think so. the they are. Of, yeah, okay. Well, well, is, yeah. Right. Well, well done to all the winners and well done, Elsa, Tanya, and Joe. That was absolutely terrific. And I look forward to hearing about all the other developments from you people and from all the other people who are listening in. Let us know what you're going to do inspired, primed even by these women. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.